Uh, well, welcome everybody and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this discussion meeting or what actually feels much more like a sort of Rooseveltian <laughs> fireside, <laughs> fireside chat. Uh, yeah. We'll see how we, uh, we get on. But it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Hugh White back to the IISS. Uh, he is a professor of strategic studies at the Australian National University, but has managed to land the very attractive gig of uh, being uh, based here in London with an affiliation to uh, King's College. And uh, we'll probably be using that time to try and uh, delve into whether the ambiguities and dilemmas of British defence policy are similar to those uh, of Australia, uh, a subject in which he is a, a noted expert, one of Australia's key commentators and experts on defence policy and the wider strategic considerations with regard to developments in the Asia Pacific that that Australian defence policy has to get to grips with. That expertise arises from a career which has involved positions in intelligence, uh, a key role, uh, the principal role in the drafting of the 2000 Australian Defence White Paper, his current academic uh, uh, career and his uh, role as somebody, uh, a leading figure in the Australian think tank community um, as well. Um, today the focus of the discussion is going to be very much, I suppose, uh, the broad strategic geopolitical questions uh, regarding Asian security, but the point more specifically at which they really come to life, which is the maritime domain. And they come to life in the maritime domain because that is where there are a number of key uh, latent or possible conflicts around territorial disputes that are very much in the news. Uh, it's very uh, prominent because that's the domain in which force posture is... Um, is evolving in various interesting ways between the various uh, participants, or one might say protagonists. Uh, and uh, it's the area in which there's been an attempt of late to try and um, innovate in a doctrinal sense as well, which is expressed, I suppose, most obviously in the juxtaposition between anti-area access denial capabilities on the one hand and the increasingly famous, if still in some senses uh, vague, air-sea battle concept which is being uh, developed and evolved by the United States and which in the title of this talk is referred to with the epithet pointlessness. Um, we'll, we'll get into the pointlessness um, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, which is going to be the, the span of uh, Professor White's remarks, and then we'll turn it over to you uh, for some questions and comments and interrogation. And uh, with that and the usual note that please do switch off your mobile phones, <laughs> um, it'll make it better for all of us to hear. Hugh, welcome to the ISS and uh, over to you. Adam, thanks very much uh, and it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be back here at the IISS and thanks very much all of you uh, for, for coming. And I should also, as uh, Adam says, it's very kind of Kings to shout me a month in, uh, in London with such beautiful weather as well. It's uh, uh, very nice to be here. Um, like everyone in Australia, I guess I'm thinking a lot about China's rise and how America responds to it. And America's response obviously depends a great deal on the judgments they make and we make, and for that matter that China makes, about the relative power between the US and China, including, not only, but including, and I think very significantly, the relative military power of the US and China in the Western Pacific. Most people, when they think about this, presuppose that the US remains very clearly preponderant in military power. Um, the United States, we've all been saying to one another for decades, is the strongest military power in the world today by so many million miles that it hardly matters. Um, and that shapes judgments about America's choices in relation to China, about America's judgments about its future role in Asia, and about uh, the kind of approach it takes to using its military power. Now, I agree with the broad proposition that the United States remains overwhelmingly the world's strongest military power. I have my copy of the military balance on my shelf. I can look it up. I can see that there's page after page of stuff there. There's so much stuff there. And I agree, what's more, that all that stuff gives the United States an unparalleled capacity to project power globally. That is, if you want to project power into the Persian Gulf or off the coast of Africa or even into the Mediterranean, Nobody can do it better than the United States. But I don't think that's what really matters when we judge the role of military power in the future US-China relationship and the military balance between those two countries. 
Because what matters then is not what America's got and not what it can do in the Gulf or off the coast of Africa or in the Mediterranean. What matters is what it can do in Asia, in, in, in the theatre, in the Western Pacific, and what China can do to stop it. And I think when we look at that question specifically, we see that the balance has shifted much more sharply away from the United States and towards China than I think most other people believe. Um, the China can, it seems to me, already challenge the key uh, elements of the US military position in the Western Pacific, which has very big implications for the US-China relationship today and that I think the scale of China's challenge to America's military position in the Western Pacific will grow over the next few decades if, as seems likely, China's economy keeps growing and its defence capabilities keep growing with it. And that the significance of this is not sufficiently recognised for the way in which the broader strategic order in Asia evolves, the way America's relationship with China evolves and the way in which America's role in the Western Pacific evolves. Moreover, I think the US is if I can use a slightly loaded term, in denial about this. I don't think the US analysis, governmental analysis, a, a, and to a certain extent a, a broader analysis within the strategic community recognises clearly enough how much things have changed. But also, just to be a little bit less gloomy you might say, I also think we need to note very significant limitations on China's capacity. I think in fact Whilst China's mil growing military capacity has done a great deal to enable it to limit America's military options in the Western Pacific, it remains the case that America can impose very significant limitations on China's military options in the Western Pacific. And what I want to do in the next 15 minutes is to tease out uh, those two sets of judgments. I'm going to cover a fair bit of terrain pretty quickly, so I'll be saying some, some fairly contentious things without spending a lot of time providing the, providing the base for it. Very happy to fill in the gaps uh, uh, when we come to some discussion. The starting point is a very simple judgment. The military foundation of America's strategic primacy in Asia has been its capacity to project power by sea. And that's not just true of America, of course, it's been true of the Western presence in the Western Pacific and in more broadly in the Asian oceans since Vasco da Gama. And another way of saying that, of course, is the United States is not really a major land power in Asia and never has been. It's exercised, it's, it's supported its strategic position with armed force to the extent that it can do stuff from the sea. And of course the foundation of power projection today as it has always been is sea control. That is your capacity to uh, keep the ships in which your power projection forces are being moved afloat. I don't want to oversimplify this but this stuff is actually pretty simple. You're going to project power by sea, you've got to keep the ships afloat. And uh, what's made America such a decisive power in Asia, particularly since 1945, you might even say since 1942, since Midway if you like, has been the United States has had very robust sea control in the Western Pacific which has allowed it to deploy air and land forces, the carriers and the marines around the Western Pacific, literal of the East Asian continent, with great uh, confidence and at relatively low risk, which has made the maintenance of power projection capability relatively low cost for the United States. Now my core judgement is that the development of China's air and naval forces over the last 30 years and particularly over the last 15 years and I think the historians will judge particularly since 1996 has resulted in a very significant increase in China's capacity to find and sink American power projection forces. In other words, it has established a significant degree of sea denial uh, in the waters close to China, which are the waters that matter, of course. If the United States wants to project power against China, it's got to be able to, got to take its ships into, into, into that water. Um, and this has, this has occurred to the point that it has very significantly raised the costs and risks to the United States of power projection in the Western Pacific. Now, I won't talk about particular capability developments that have delivered that. Uh, it's a big and interesting subject in itself, but the submarines, of course, uh, significant expansion in air capability, including anti-air, uh, anti-ship missile capabilities, uh, and a very substantial investment in 
um, if they work the anti-ship ballistic missiles, I guess, are the key elements of this, plus some pretty significant investments in surveillance systems to deploy and support this. Now, of course, the United States knows this. They're not stupid. They can see what's going on. And they've responded. The very specific operational concept. Um, uh, the air-sea battle concepts, um, which is, if you like, the, un the, the operational concept that underlies the shift in strategic priorities reflected in the pivot or rebalancing to Asia, which has been so central to Obama's Asia policy, specifically aims to restore US sea control and therefore re-establish the, the US capacity to project power by sea again. And the working hypothesis, I think, in the US and I think in most of the Western community, is that this will work. That if the United States chooses to devote substantial resources, the resources, so to speak, made available in the Asian theatre by the pivot, to uh, 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 an operational concept, to support an operational concept designed to um, uh, erode China's sea denial capabilities and restore American sea control, it will succeed. And that will restore the operational status quo, and that will therefore restore the strategic status quo and provide the military underpinnings for the United States to maintain the primacy in Asia, which is uh, at the foundation of the, 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 the previous or the current order in Asia, and I would say the core of American strategic objectives. <coughs> and so my message to you here today is that I don't believe that's true. I don't think the SC battle is going to work. Um, and I I think that's true for three reasons. Uh, the first is that I don't think it will succeed operationally. That is, I think it's unlikely that the United States will be able to, uh, with the kinds of operations they're talking about, sufficiently erode China's sea denial capabilities to the point that the costs and risks to the United States of power projection by sea, in other words, its capacity to restore sea control, is great enough to make those co the costs and risks of power projection by sea acceptable to the United States. Now it's worth bearing in mind here that sea control and sea denial are not absolutes. What happens as the, balance, the military balance at sea shifts is that the costs and risks you have to take of sending your ships into a certain area go up as the other guy's capacity to sink them increases. And so my point is not a question as to whether America has sea control or hasn't got it, China can achieve sea denial or can't, it's that as the balance shifts the costs of the United States go up. And my sense is that the United that the United States is very unlikely operationally, even with very substantial resources devoted to a very innovatively designed air sea battle concept, to sufficiently erode China's sea denial capabilities as to put, put the costs and risks of power projection back into play. Now, one of the reasons for that is that the strategic competition between the US and China in the Western Pacific seems to me to be deeply asymmetrical in four different ways. The first is there's an asymmetry of focus. That is, the United States is a global power and I think will remain one as the debate over the pivot showed when Obama announced it. Nobody believes the United States can focus even <coughs> a, a, a significant preponderance of its efforts in Asia alone. It, it's got commitments in many other parts of the world, whereas China, I believe, is overwhelmingly focused in its own littoral. China, of course, has interests in the rest of the world, but it's, it, its requirements and its willingness to deploy substantial forces beyond, uh, beyond Asia to support those interests, I think, are very low. So it has an advantage of focus. That's where China's going to put all its effort. Second is it has an advantage of location. The, the location on which China is focusing is its own backyard. And that gives it immense operational advantages for a start. It's operating very close to home bases. The United States has all the complexities and costs of sustaining a, a position across a very wide ocean indeed. And thirdly, related to that, there's an asymmetry of commitment. That is, China and the United States are competing in China's front yard, and geography does make a huge difference. If this was a strategic competition between the United States and China and the Caribbean, I would call the shots exactly the other way. China can't compete with the United States and the Caribbean, partly because of the point of location, but also because America really cares what happens in the Caribbean. Now, you could say it really cares about what happens in Asia. Not that much, not as much as China does. And that makes a huge difference. And lastly, it, there's, there's a great asymmetry in operational task. Because sea denial in the end is much, much easier than sea control. Now, I'll just spend a minute explaining that because it's very important to my, to my argument. I think the fact that the, the advantage of sea denial over sea control uh, is, is a reflection of things which go very deep into 
the technology and operational circumstances of, of, of maritime warfare. Partly it's just a matter of the sort of traditional advantage of, of, of uh, offence over defence, that is the offence just needs to be strong at a place of its choosing, the defence has to be strong everywhere and sea control is an inherently defensive posture. But also because sea control requires persistence, we've got to be there all the time. It means it's got to be done from ships. And sea denial doesn't. Ever since people found ways to sink ships which don't involve very big guns, and therefore you could do sea, when that started happening, you could, you could do sea denial without a ship. You didn't have to use a ship the same size as the other guy's ship in order to sink a ship. That's been true for a long time. It's been true since before the First World War. I think for a century now we've been wrestling with the fact that the capacity to sink a ship without using another ship, to sink a ship from a platform which is much smaller and cheaper than a, than a ship, has made the asymmetry between sea denial and sea control very, very stark. And I think this is pretty clearly demonstrated in the strange history of naval warfare in the 20th century. But it's been amplified in the last decade or two by the other side of the element, and that is the very significant expansion in our capacity to find ships. What, what, what made sea denial less easy than it should have been after the invention of the submarine, uh, uh, the aircraft and so on, was the fact that it remained pretty hard to find ships in a big ocean. Uh, that problem has now got a lot easier as well. So I would argue that um, we're now in a position where, in a very broad range of circumstances, uh, achieving sea control against a capable adversary, a major power, or even a very <coughs> substantial middle power, in waters uh, over, over which they can project significant um, uh, capability, so we're quite close to their own uh, territory or bases, is going to be extremely hard in all sorts of circumstances, and I think that applies particularly in relation to China today. Now, many people would find that judgment surprising because they'd be surprised by the judgment that the PLA is that good. This is, after all, the United States Navy and Air Force we're talking about them taking on. And it is worth bearing in mind that the PLA is, as a, as a significant maritime force, still very new and relatively untried. So if I was the PLA, at least, I'd be very careful not to be too confident about how good they've become. But I also think we should be very careful not to be too complacent about how good they've become. Uh, you know, there are two characteristic mistakes in situations like this when we look at an unknown potential adversary. But one is to overestimate them, the other is to underestimate them. And the trick is to do neither of those. I don't think we should overestimate the Chinese capability, but I think we should be very careful not to underestimate it and we should also note its trajectory. Our working hypothesis should be that China's capabilities will continue to grow as fast for the next 15 years as they have for the last 15 years. And 15 years is not very long in our business. So, uh, it's a, not just a judgment about what China can do today, it's what it can do in future. And in particular, the scale of its forces um, uh, comes into play very significantly. The sheer number of platforms available. Quantity has a quality all its own. And that is uh, as true at sea as uh, it was on land uh, when Zhukov said it. It's also just worth bearing in mind that China as an adversary is not like Iraq. One of the things that strikes me in some of the American discussion about the SE battle is that the whole concept is actually framed in a, in, in a context which includes not just China but also adversaries in the Middle East like Iran. I think this is a major mistake. Uh, China is a qualitatively different kind of adversary. Much, much bigger. Much, much stronger. I think uh, for, th for that reason I think we should be very careful about presuming that the PLA can't do significant stuff. So. Um, now, that judge, that, that those, those arguments are intended to support the judgment that the air-sea battle won't, won't restore sea control for the United States as an operational point. A second argument is that even if it does succeed operationally, the air-sea battle won't achieve the strategic effect that the United States requires. Because it's worth bearing in mind sea control, even if the air-sea battle restores sea control for the United States, so they can then sail the carriers and sail their marines again up to uh, uh, conflict with China. That only provides the means for power projection. The strategic result depends on the capacity of the forces projected to actually do what's required to get whatever the outcome is. And I don't believe the United States has forces that it can project by sea, even if it achieves sea control, with sufficient weight to make any difference at all to an adversary the scale of China. 
say you have a very good day with the fleet programmers, say you can get eight of the carriers hard up against the China coast and you can extract a maximum rate of effort out of those carriers, their capacity to actually deliver sufficient strategic operational effect on Chinese targets to significantly change China's policy seems to me to be very low. Say you get two thirds of the Marine Corps, 120,000 Marines landed on the coast of China. What are they going to do? They're not going to march on Beijing. This is not, this is not Iraq. I don't believe the United States, even if it restores power projection, can achieve decisive strategic effects against China. So I don't know what the theory of victory underpinning the air-sea battle is. Um, and the third point, of course, is that, hang on, wait a minute, before we even got to that, in order to do the air-sea battle, to make it possible to project this power against China, the United States has already had to run what would be a very sustained and intense campaign of airstrikes and naval strikes against China's sea denial capabilities. This, it is absolutely clear, would entail a very substantial uh, campaign of strikes against a wide <coughs> range of mainland Chinese targets, including, for example, a large number of ballistic missile sites. This seems to me to be, I mean, to say that this is escalatory is an understatement. The idea that China just sits there for not just a day or a week, but a month or two months while this rolling campaign of strikes goes on and does nothing is simply fanciful. The, 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 uh, an attempt to undertake the air-sea battle would, pr would produce a major war with China. And when I say major war, I mean a war on a scale which, I'm going to have a quick look around the room, we have not experienced in our lifetime at least not for a long time anyway. It's a, this, is a, this is a major conflict. And so the question for the United States is, is this, uh, is this an, uh, uh, is the escalatory impact of the air sea battle, the fact that it, that it runs such a very high risk of a conflict, of, of a major conflict with China, can that be justified in terms of the US objectives uh, that it would be trying to achieve? It seems to me, uh, that it can't. The United States does not have escalation dominance over China in conflicts in the Western Pacific where the US-China story is going to be thrashed out. The costs of, uh, so as the costs of, of asserting sea control go up through the air-sea battle um, and the implications for that for US-China conflict, uh, uh, the, the, the threshold for US intervention goes up um, and, uh, and the usability of this strategic option goes down. People used to say that the beauty of the US posture in the Western Pacific base as it was primarily on aircraft carriers was that aircraft car with an aircraft carrier you could project power without going to war. It was an old sort of slogan in, uh, in Hawaii. And it used to be true. As long as you've got uncontested sea control, you can project power without going to war. Now that's changed. What the SE battle tells you is the United States, in order to project power, now has to go to war first. So even to achieve a, moder a moderate strategic result by projecting, by using the carriers. The United States has to first have entered a conflict which would almost certainly produce um, a, a major conflict with China. So, for, 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 tho for, the, for those three reasons, I don't think the air sea battle will preserve or restore the military foundation of US primacy in Asia. In fact, I think it's, an it's a classic example of an operational concept without a strategic context. That is, the re the, for, for I think a lot of people thinking about this, the restoration of sea control, because it's been so important to the US in the past, is seen as an end in itself. We've just got to get sea control back. You've got to ask yourself, well, why exactly do you want sea control back? What are you going to do with it and how much is it going to cost? And it's worth just bearing in mind, this judgment is not based on, a, on, on gloomy conclusions about the trajectory of the present US defence budget or sequestration or anything like this. The difficulty of the United States at maintaining sea control in the Western Pacific is not just because the US defence budget is going through a tricky time at the moment. Even if it got back onto the kind of trajectory that it had uh, half a decade ago, even if the US Navy was going to end up and the Air Force were going to end up much bigger than it seems likely they are, I think these constraints would still apply. And what that suggests is the US cannot sustain the traditional strategic posture in Asia 
that uh, sea control and power projection has underpinned for the last many decades. And I should make the point, to, to anyone who lives in, in the, on the Asian littoral, certainly to anyone from Australia, this is no source of comfort. US primacy in Asia and the sea control and power projection capabilities have underpinned it have been immensely good for Asia and immensely good for Australia. I'm very sorry that they're slipping away, but I think we need to face the fact that they are slipping away pretty realistically. Now, does that mean that the US is finished in Asia? Does that mean that the Western Pacific becomes a Chinese lake? Not at all. Because all of the arguments I've just given as to why it's so hard for the United States to sustain sea control in the face of China's sea denial capabilities apply with equal force against China's capacity to achieve sea control and project power by sea against the forces of America, or for that matter, any other fairly substantial power. Um, as Corbett said uh, all the way back in the beginning of the century, uh, a country can lose uh, sea control without another country acquiring it. In fact, I think what we're very likely to move into is an era in which no country can achieve sea control and project substantial forces by sea in waters that really matter to another great power or even a substantial middle power um, uh, who's, if, if they're prepared to, to, to spend serious money uh, to build up the sea denial capabilities involved. And I think we should expect to see that in Asia in the future. As far as China's concerned, that means that China will only be able to achieve sea control and therefore project power by sea in circumstances in which its interests in that outcome are so great that they can persuade the United States that they'd be willing to use their own nuclear forces to deter US conventional intervention in the crisis. And I think that's only true of Taiwan. I, I, now there's, there's a lot buried in that judgment, but I think, I, so I, I think beyond Taiwan, I think the US, and for that matter, other countries like Japan, will have the capacity to prevent China projecting power by sea. You might make you ask what the Chinese aircraft carrier is all about. Good question. I don't think it looks like a very smart acquisition to me. <coughs> now, um, uh, in this sort of sea denial world, that's what we're heading into. Uh, I think the Western Pacific will become, at least at that level, no one's ocean. N no one's going to be able to control this, 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 this bit of water as long as serious uh, countries are trying to stop them. Now, what does this mean for Asia and the US? Well, it's worth bearing in mind that on land, particularly close to China's borders, and China's borders cover an awful lot of land, um, the military balance will always favour China, with the possible exception of whatever happens in Russia, where you know, the I find the tra trajectory of Russia very hard to see. But on land, I think China's position is going to remain very strong. But at sea, China will have no capacity to project power against the US, um, but, it will, but it will have the capacity to prevent the United States projecting power against, against it. We will, in, in, this, in this no one's ocean kind of world, um, we, we will end up with a kind of potentially rather stable maritime balance. That suggests that a new order in Asia which most closely, a strategic order in Asia which most closely matches and fits this military balance, at least at sea, is one of equal power sharing between equal great powers. Not, a, not, a, not, a, not US primacy in other words. I don't think that military balance can sustain US primacy as we've known it. But not Chinese hegemony either. I don't think China can establish hegemony over Asia if it can't project power by sea because the, the maritime world is so important uh, to East Asia. So it's not US primacy, it's not Chinese hegemony, it's something else. It's a world of mutual restraint where those two powers and perhaps some others like Japan can constrain one another. To me, that points the way towards a model of Asia's future which looks more like a concert of powers than anything else. But that's an argument I've made at another place, and I'll leave it for another day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. So you, you took your sponge and you wiped SC Battle from the drawing board, uh, and then uh, you provided the, the, the comforting reflection that 
there are distinct limitations on the other hand on what China can achieve. And then just in the last few minutes there, you describe essentially a kind of a maritime mutual deterrent yes, world right. with fairly uh, benign outcomes uh, uh, associated with that. But um, that's, that's not necessarily the only uh, future that one could no. predict for Asia. Uh, when you look at uh, current trends, for instance, there's still very much competitive defense acquisition, um, arms build up, no shortage of uh, funds available for defense. Do you think there's, a, there's another possible future for Asia in which actually uh, this apparent form of deterrence that you've, uh, de facto form of deterrence you've described, leads to an incessant search for some kind of advantage uh, by one side over another in the manner of a kind of classic security dilemma or more appropriately perhaps in the manner of rather traditional forms of great power rivalry. The idea that people will sort of survey the scene and say, well, we, you know, we're, we are mutually deterred, therefore let's hold up our hands and let's all work together in a concert of Asia uh, system um, might be overridden by more traditional competitive instincts. Uh, yes, uh, ab absolutely. Um, uh, so let me, let, let me just establish the very important distinction between pre prediction and prescription. Um, I, th I think it is perfectly possible to build an order in Asia in which the major powers manage their competition and prevent it getting out of hand. And I think the, the sea denial world that I've described would in a sense support that. But I don't predict that will happen. I think it's extraordinarily hard to happen. Um, the, fact when I, the, the fact that I compare it to a concert of power, um, in concerts of power are notoriously hard to build and hard to sustain. We had two, in a sense, failed attempts in the, in the 20th century, um, just for a start. It shows how hard that is to do. So I don't think that's the most likely outcome. I think the most likely outcome is precisely as you say, that, 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 that countries will continue to compete. I think a more likely outcome is that the US and China will continue to compete. That is, the two sides will fail to see that they're not going to achieve strategic primacy. Um, and in fact, I think the trajectory of US-China relationships over the last um, uh, 10 years, and particularly over the last three years, has seen a, a, an, an escalating pattern of, of, um, of strategic competition, and particularly of maritime competition. I think that's why we're seeing this, this series of issues like the um, like Scarborough Shoals and Senkaku, Daewoo Island uh, uh, crises and so on. And so I, I, I'm therefore actually quite pessimistic about the trajectory of, of Asia. That, you know, the good news is the military balance is one that could sustain, I think, quite a stable concept-like order. The bad news is I think we're much more likely to see, this being the real world, uh, human beings being what they are, are much more likely to see a worse outcome. But I would just make this point. The best reason to believe that we might avoid that outcome is that it would be so catastrophic and that there's a moderate chance that political leaders and communities will see how catastrophic it is. Because uh, escalating strategic rivalry between the United States and China is not just your average day in the office in the Ministry of Defence. These are the world's two most powerful states. The, the, poten the potential, the scale of conflict that could occur between them is a scale of conflict we haven't seen, I don't like to be melodramatic, since the Second World War. Uh, there is no reason to be confident that the US-China conflict, even if it began in a small scale, would not escalate to a major war, and I believe that the threshold for nuclear escalation of a, of a US-China conflict is both low and very unclear. And so, to my mind, the incentives to, to, so to speak, defeat the odds and build the kind of stable order which I think the military balance I'm talking about would sustain are very high, but of course history is full of examples where the incentives have been very high but people haven't followed them anyway. Uh, and that might well be what happens. Great. Well, we've got about uh, 25 minutes now for Q&A, so we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, if you'd like to just catch my eye, wait for the microphone to reach you in the usual way, and for Hugh's benefit rather than mine, give your name, and if you feel it's relevant, your affiliation. Um, Lady Kennett, to begin with here in the front, and then we'll move to the next one. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk. I agreed 110%, as oh, I believe you. we know nowadays say when we mean very much. Um, you didn't mention UNCLOS. You didn't mention law no. at all. 
Do you think that has any, any role to play in the future? Question one. Question two, what do you think American motivation is in the West Pacific? Yes. Why do they want to be there yeah. so much? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two really excellent questions. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the first one uh, is a terrifically interesting <coughs> one because, um, and it's frankly one I find a little bit hard to get my head around. We, we, we have, for the last, um, well, for the last 20 years, obviously, since the end of the Cold War, to a certain extent since the beginning of the Cold War, since the end of the Second World War, we've lived, lived in a world in which the alignment of power has been reasonably stable. I mean, we had a stable alignment of power between the US and the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union disappeared on us. And then we had a stable alignment of power with the United States as a kind of a, as a, as a unipolar power. And so one of the things we've lost the habit of doing is observing the role of power in shaping international <coughs> institutions and legal frameworks and so on. I think the legal frameworks are extremely important. I think, I think UNCLOS and the whole you know, broader sort of fra framework of, of management of international relations at sea is terrifically important for the way in which the Western Pacific is going to evolve. But I think we need to recognise that that is going to be subject to the dictates of power politics from both sides. And we haven't, I think we've, we, we sort of lack experience um, as, to, as to how that interaction is going to happen. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I, I do think it's important, but I don't think we're going to be able to resolve the question of the relationship between the US and China and the inherent strategic competition between them for leadership in Asia simply by going back to the law books. Uh, I think these guys are going to start appealing against the authority of the, in fact they both do in their way, uh, appealing against the authority of the law books and, and finding a way to re-establish a law-based order in Asia for management of maritime issues and for that matter more broadly, um, which both sides accept, is one way of defining the task. And for the reasons that I mentioned in response to Adam, I'm not very optimistic that's going to happen. The question about what's in, what America is after in Asia is also a really critical one. And I, I'm always a bit in danger here of sounding more anti-American than I really am. Because um, I'm not at all. If I had my way, I would love the United States to continue to be the, the uncontested primary power in Asia forever because it's been terrific for Australia and I think it's actually been terrific for Asia. The problem is it's just not going to happen because America's primacy does seem to me to be now contested by China for, for reasons that go very deep into the whole redistribution of power in the world with, uh, with uh, you know, what the economic historians call the Great Convergence. So, but nonetheless, it does seem to me that the United States is deeply committed to preserving primacy in Asia and I think there are two reasons for that. The first is, I think, a failure of imagination. And that is, I think, to most Americans, and for that matter to most of us, um, we tend to assume that the only alternative to US primacy in Asia is Chinese primacy. That unless we can preserve the status quo, we'll lapse straight into Chinese hegemony. And a lot of the way in which American political leaders, for example, talk about the importance of sustaining US leadership in Asia, you can see, not stated, but in the sort of underpinning assumptions, the judgment that if we're not in charge, China will be in charge. And of course that makes a very strong argument for sustaining US primacy, because nobody wants to live under China's shadow. My argument is that there's a third option. That is, there are futures for Asia which are neither Chinese US primacy or Chinese primacy. There are lots of different ways in which Asia might work. And some of them could be quite stable and quite effective. Um, and certainly more stable and effective than active strategic competition between the US and China. So I think that's, and, and what, what the, the, second, the second part of it, I think is just the fact that um, for the United States, being a, the leader in Asia, and for that matter leading globally, is a very deep part of its self-identity. It wasn't always, it has become a part of its self-identity. I don't. Uh, I, don't, I don't begrudge Americans that. I think actually Americans have done an immense amount of good in the world and I can see why Americans are attached to the idea of their own leadership. But I do think, I said before, I think the United States is, is in denial. I don't think it's in decline. I think the United States remains a fantastically powerful state. But I do think um, there is a question as to how thoroughly the United States, and of course it's very clumsy to generalise about such a huge and complex country in one noun, but I do think the United States um, 
has failed to really come to terms with what it means to deal with a country as powerful as China is. China is more powerful relative to the United States than any country has ever been since the United States moved out of its own sort of self-imposed uh, shell in the late, 18th century, late 19th century. And what it's going to mean for the United States to deal with a country of that power, I think, is something the Americans haven't yet come to terms with. So there's a default idea that the only appropriate role for the United States in a region like Asia is leadership, is very deeply embedded in the idea that the United States is the most powerful country in the world. When that's no longer true, it's still a very powerful country. It still has a scope to play a huge role in Asia, a very significant role in Asia. But I don't think we've yet seen the imagination required to do that. Thanks. Just the gentleman here in the front in the aisle. Thank you. Um, name's Mahmoud Ali. Um, I'm a member of the Institute and a student of US-China relations. Mm. We have corresponded. Um, I want to relay a question asked by a number of Chinese uh, interlocutors who say for about 18 or 19 years, between 1971 and 1989, the United States and China were actually secret collaborators against the Soviet Union. Uh, what is it that the Chinese need to do to make sure they are not seen as a peer competitor or a strategic adversary? What do they, is there anything they can do? Um, uh, I think there's two parts to the answer to that. I don't think there's anything that China can do to avoid being seen as a strategic competitor with the United States uh, of some kind, unless it actually is prepared to accept American primacy as the foundation of the Asian order for the indefinite future. And my working hypothesis is that the Chinese simply will not do that. Um, and that really goes very deep to the question about what state, how states see themselves. Um, so, you know, my working hypothesis is that as China's power grows, it does become more ambitious for a bigger role in Asia. Um, in a book I've recently published, I argue why that should be so at some, at some length, but in the end it goes down to very deep feelings about, and you know, I, I say, if Australia's economy did somewhat better than it is at the moment, and we suddenly became the world's second largest economy and the strongest economy in Asia, we'd want to run the region. If New Zealand did, they'd want to run the region. I, I don't think we should be surprised that China does. So I think, I think that's, that, that can't be avoided. Um, but I, but, but there's, there's a second question which I think is more important, and that is not does China contest American primacy, but what is it prepared to settle for itself? That is, okay, it doesn't want American primacy. What, what does it want? And one of, the, one of the real conundrums about China today is that we don't know what China wants, and neither do the Chinese. My sense is, and I'm not a China expert, I don't speak Chinese, the best I can do is to speak to many Chinese friends and colleagues in English, um, but my sense is that most Chinese deeply hope and expect that China will lead Asia, not in a sort of harsh hegemonic Stalinist way, but in a sort of soft, rather Monroe Doctrine China way, but that, um, but, but my own working hypothesis is that China is not going to be strong enough to dominate Asia even in a relatively soft way that the United States dominates the Western Pacific, uh, the Western Hemisphere. There are no other great powers in the Western Hemisphere. There are other great powers in, in, in the Western Pacific. So I don't think China's going to be able to do that. Um, and the question is whether the Chinese will accept that and whether the Chinese will, will be prepared not to abandon their aspirations for a bigger role, but to limit those aspirations to, this is a very complex issue, expressed very simply, but whether they're prepared to accept a relationship of equality with the United States and with other great powers in Asia, or whether they're going to try to insist on something more than that, I think will determine whether the US-China relationship has a chance of being stable or not, or at least will half determine it. The other half is whether America is prepared to accept that. Are the US and China prepared to treat one another as equals? If they are, then I think there's a moderate chance they can establish a stable order in Asia that accommodates both of their power. If they're not, if either the US insists on maintaining primacy or the Chinese insist on asserting it, then I think the prospects of, for peace and stability in the Western Pacific are very grim. Two Middle Kingdoms. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> Christian Lumiere. Uh, thank you, Professor White, for a, a fascinating discussion. If I could um, posit two uh, points to test your hypotheses yes. here and uh, gauge your reactions. 
Um, the first is the, the title of your presentation is The Pointlessness of ASPC, uh, which suggests to me we should be talking about the goals and not just the implementation of it. Yeah. Now, if the goals of ASPC uh, are to mean that it's effective when implemented and when it is used, then I think your, your case may be strong. But are the goals of ASBC to actually be that it's never used? That is, ASBC is simply there to reassure allies in the region and to deter China right. and to send yeah. a sl slightly calibrated point to China. This is a defensive rather than offensive structure yeah. and posture yeah. Yeah. that the US is, is yeah. um, suggesting. And the second of which is um, I think you make a very strong case for the fact that ASBC will be difficult to implement uh, for the US um, individually, but would it not also be implemented in concert with its allies in the region? Yeah, yeah. And would that affect your assessment of whether it could actually yeah, yeah, ever be yeah, used? Yeah, yeah. No, two really good uh, questions, Christian, and I've, I mean, I've learned a lot from your own writing on this subject. Um, on, on the first one, it goes to a very deep point. I'm a bit old-fashioned about this stuff, and that is that I think military postures, including the operational concepts in which they're framed, um, I only have, so to speak, uh, uh, a, a broader strategic effect, or you might say a deterrent effect, to the extent that, they're, that it's believed they're going to work. And so what counts, what, what matters for the, for, for, for the, for the um, proposition you're suggesting in your question, that is that, that the SE battle might work even if it won't work, because, uh, because the China is, it requires the Chinese to believe that it would work. And I've always thought, when it's approaching questions of force planning and, and, and operational planning, is that if I don't think it's going to work, I don't think the other guy's likely to, because I don't think he's a mug. And so it seems to me that um, the Chinese are perfectly capable of constructing the argument that I've just constructed, and in fact I think that is exactly the argument they construct. Um, uh, they've thought quite a lot about sea denial. You can see that in the way they've built their forces. And uh, I, d I don't think, and you can also see it in the way they've conducted themselves over the last, <laughs> last, last couple of years, and you might even say the last few weeks. Uh, I think they're pretty confident of their position. And so, it, 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 you know, the, 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 the short answer is uh, uh, operational concepts and forces, for that matter, only deter to the extent that they would manifestly achieve their objectives where they implemented, and I don't think this one is credible enough to do that. It, w were it credible enough to do it, I think it could, it could exactly have that effect. Second question about allies. This is a very big question and, and could be the subject for a whole separate discussion, if you know what I mean. I, I, I think US alliances in Asia are much less of an asset and much more of a liability to the United States than they appear. Um, and there's se several reasons for that. Um, one, one of them um, is that with the exception of Japan, the capabilities available are not that great. And, um, and uh, it's worth bearing in mind that because, remember, the US task is, is sea control, that is, they have to destroy an awful lot of Chinese stuff before they have a high level of confidence that, that, uh, that the Chinese capacity to sink US ships has been degraded far enough. Now, the fact that, you know, the Chinese, on, uh, the Japanese on a good day might be able to get, what, maybe 12, 12 additional boats to sea, for example, that'd be helpful. You'd certainly want it. You know, the, the Koreans might be able to get six, Australia might be able to get well, let's say one to be generous. Um, a minimum of one. Don't get, don't get me. Well, you reckon that's a minimum, do you? Let me tell you a thing. Uh, uh, don't get me started on our submarine program. Anyway, you know, he put out a few more, but actually, th this isn't Germany in the, in, in, the, in the Cold War, if you know what I mean. This is not a great big asset in the heart of the battle space, which fundamentally changes. Uh, the shape of the battle. These are relatively modest additions to what are anyway fairly substantial US capabilities. So I actually don't think in sheer numbers terms, sheer mill balance terms, I don't think, I don't think they make enough difference. The second thing is uh, there's real doubts that they'd be there. Um, you know, the question you've got to ask yourself is um, if, the, if the US goes to war with China over the Senkakus, which is a less ludicrous proposition than we would all hope, Japan would be there, South Korea wouldn't be, neither would Australia. You know, that's a, that's a big, bold judgment for you, but I'm pretty confident of it. If, uh, if the US goes to war with China over um, Scarborough Shoals, Japan wouldn't be there, I reckon. I mean, you could have an interesting debate about that, but I don't think the Japanese would be there, and neither would Australia. Philippines would be there, full weight of the Philippine submarine service would be at your disposal. <laughs> 
Um, if the US and China go to war over Taiwan, which I think is much less likely now than it has been, but I'd never dismiss it, I don't think anyone would be there. It, this is not NATO. You know, this is, a, this is actually a weaker alliance structure than it looks. And the complexity of it, people's relationships with China is, you know, it's, it's very great. So I actually, mm. I, I, I don't think that saves the SC battle. Um, gentleman in the third row next to the gentleman with the green jumper. Hello? Yep, just over there. You want to just put your hand <coughs> up so the microphone can see. Um, Howard Bodie, uh, Minister of Defence. Um, as a follow-on to the alliance question, this is a sort of supplementary, um, are the US intending to um, join with allies in the air sea battle concept? Um, are they going to train, exchange uh, information, techniques, and so on? That's the and secondly, you've portrayed air sea battle as being used in something approaching a, a, a major war context. Um, what if the US have more limited aims, freedom of navigation, restoration of sovereignty to certain disputed islands and so on. Is, does EC battle have more of a utility here? No, very good, uh, very good pair of questions. Um, look, on the, on the first one, I think, um, I think the US aim in Asia is very clearly to um, reconfigure the alliance structure that it's had in Asia, you know, really since 1951 and the signature of the San Francisco treaties. Um, into a much closer knit, denser, more substantive um, coalition, uh, uh, precisely to support the United States both militarily in fighting the air sea battle and whatever might flow from it, and also politically and strategically to resist China's challenge to US primacy. And although uh, my many friends in the American system deny this with great fervor, I, I do think this is essentially a containment strategy. Uh, put it this way, if, if you accept that China is trying to resist, uh, is, is trying to contest US primacy as the foundation of the Asian order, and if you accept that the United States is trying to preserve it, and I think both of those things are pretty true, then it's pretty clear to me that the purpose of the pivot and the diplomatic initiatives we've seen in the last 18 months and so on is to help assemble and thicken a coalition of US friends and allies in the Western Pacific to support the United States in preserving the status quo and therefore in resisting China's challenge to the status quo. Now, it, 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 it's a matter of, you know, Humpty Dumpty said, that you, my words will, you, will mean whatever I want them to mean. And so if you choose to, not to call that containment, all right. But to me, it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it looks to me like containment. Now, I, I think this is very different from what the United States has been trying to do in Asia before. Um, and uh, in Australia's case, for example, and for that matter of the others as well, our alliances with, China, with, with, with America having originally been conceived very much as a response to the loss of China to the Communists in 1949, then after 1972 ceased to be focused on China, and now, since I would say November last year when Barack Obama gave his big speech in Canberra, have now been redefined again in terms of uh, response to China, and that is a, a very complex and, and you know, poses countries like Australia a huge set of questions which the marine deployment did Darwin put pretty much on the table. I do think it's, it's a very important part of US thinking about uh, its approach to China, its an approach to Asia that will draw the, the allies into something that, to be blunt and to oversimplify, looks much more like NATO. Um, and put it this way, if it was going to work at all, I mean, it goes back to Christian's point, if the AC battle was going to have any chance, it would need to pull in all of those additional resources. So that, if you're determined to pursue that strategy, that would be the right thing to do. I do think that's what America has in mind. Um, but I don't think it's going to succeed for the reason that I mentioned. I don't think in the end the Allies have a sufficient sense of shared concern, um, at least at the moment. That depends, of course, on a, a lot on how badly China behaves. If China starts behaving like the Soviet Union and its bad days, then we'll, we'll all support the United States then. But China today is not the Soviet Union. It's a much more complex, ambiguous, uncertain kind of beast. Um, now, the second part of your question, I've forgotten. Yes. Um, one of the things that makes the present situation, to my mind, in Asia very dangerous is precisely that although that, that we, we see a series of crises, particularly at sea, which are in themselves very limited, you know, Scarborough Shoals, Senkaku's, you name it, um, 
potentially also freedom of navigation questions. Um, it seems to me that, and what's striking is that these, in themselves quite trivial questions, are, are driving, um, are raising risks about the relationship between the US and China, which, so to speak, they shouldn't, in their nature, intrinsically raise. Um, why is this happening? It seems to me it's because um, both China and the United States, in their different and interactive ways, have chosen to see these relatively minor things as the kind of tokens or test cases of the, the, the inherent competition between them for um, a position in the Western Pacific, of China's attempt to challenge the US um, uh, maritime-based primacy and America's determination to, to, to reassert it. Uh, and the reason that's significant is that the, 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 the chance is then pretty high that any small-scale thing quickly escalates into a big-scale thing. So let me just give you a 30-second scenario. Um, you know, just to take the Senkaku's case, and by using the Japanese name, I'm not trying to suggest my alignment on the issue. Um, take the Senkaku's case. If, 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 if a if events around the Senkaku's result in a Chinese attack on a Japanese ship and the Japanese look over their shoulder and say to the United States, are you prepared to come and help? Uh, the United States has got a very tough choice to make. If it sails its carriers, for example, uh, up to support China, uh, support Japan, uh, Ch China starts making threatening gestures, uh, the, 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 the Chinese sink another Japanese ship, the Americans have got to decide whether or not they're prepared to use the forces on their carrier to attack the Chinese task group. They therefore have to ask themselves, what happens if the Chinese then sink our carrier? And once a carrier is sunk, it's a major war. It's no, it's no longer small scale. So what, what makes this situation so risky is precisely the chance of escalating from minor to major. In some situations, including I think a lot of situations on the Korean Peninsula, where for various historical reasons it, th that, that, that situation is not seen by either side as a test for their future status, at least not at the moment, then I think there's all sorts of scope for, for the crises to be managed. It's the ones where both sides have seen them as symbolic of their deeper long-term position in the Western Pacific, which, w w where the risk of escalation is so serious. And there, I think, um, uh, you know, and precisely the reason I think this is such a dangerous situation is that I think um, th there our chances of building fire breaks between minor issues and major crises are pretty low. One doesn't want to overstress this metaphor but there is something a bit Sarajevo about this. I mean, Sarajevo 1914 about this. Um, and uh, that's what makes the present moment, I think, so distinctive. Um, yes, in the front here, in the front, front row, yes. Thank you, Professor, very interesting talk. Um, it seems to me that... Uh, Can you just give your name and a... So yes, Michael Court, Ministry of Defence. It uh, seems to me that a lot, uh, uh, well, a couple of underlying assumptions between talk of potential conflict between the Americans and the Chinese uh, is based on um, the fact that the Chinese economy will continue to do well, grow strongly, and also that the Communist Party will retain strong domestic control. If either of these two things were to change, in your opinion, would that increase or decrease the likelihood of conflict? A um, very, very important question. Um, and, 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 a very, and a very big one, but let me, just, let me just give you the quick answer. Two points. The first is, it's worth bearing in mind China, China's power is not something that might happen in the future. China is already more powerful relative to the United States than any country has ever been since America started behaving as an international actor, really, uh, at, at, at all, at least beyond the Western Hemisphere. Um, so it's not that China might one day, if, if, if the economics and politics go right, acquire the power to challenge the US position in the Western Pacific. It's really got that power. So it, in a sense, even if, I think rather improbably, China just flatlined from here, it would still be posing uh, a, a challenge economically and militarily. It would still be posing, I think, a challenge which would make uh, to, to US uh, maritime primacy in the Western Pacific, which would make the status quo unsustainable. Uh, now, of course, I can't be sure for a moment what's going to happen to China's uh, economy, but I, I think um, when we think about China's long-term strategic future and, and where the US-China relationship should therefore be going and where Asia should therefore be going, um, I think it's important to distinguish between the medium, short to medium term ups and downs and the long-term trend. 
Um, I think China's economy, I'm not an economist, I think China's economy is going through some significant issues at the moment. And I think there's even a solid argument, though not as clear as some people do, that China's, that the days of 10% per annum real have passed us. Um, but the chances of China continuing to grow at 6 or 7% per annum, on average, for quite a few decades to come, are quite high, assuming the politics can hold together, and I'll come back to the politics in a second. Now, even at 6 or 7% per annum real, and even with the US, as I think it has a good chance of doing, getting back to growing at something like 2 or 2.5% 2 per annum real over the long term, China's economy still ends up being twice as big as the United States by 2040 or 2050. Now, 20 or 40 or 2050 is actually not that, long, not, not that far away. Uh, the capability decisions that countries like Australia and the United Kingdom are making today will determine the forces that we have then. Um, and so, you know, this is, you know, the decades whiz by. Um, so I think even with a, a fairly gloomy prognostication about China's economic growth, it, it, its chances of being strong enough to raise all the questions we're talking about being at very high. Very briefly on politics. Um, I think the chances of China undergoing some kind of fundamental change in its political system are quite high over the next few decades. But I think the chances of it managing that while still maintaining a long-term trajectory of growth at maybe 6 or 7% is also high. Almost every country that's gone through an industrial revolution, which is what's happening in China, of course, uh, has also gone through a political revolution. And some political revolutions are incredibly boring, like the British one, you know, the Reform Acts of 1830 or whatever, the most boring bit of history going. Some are very exciting. The French did it in a rather dramatic way. Um, but what happens is often there's, a, there's some jiggles in the curve. In none of them does it stop the growth in the long term. And I don't think there's, I don't think there's any reason to believe that the Chinese are going to be a bit any dumber about this than anybody else is. They will, they will go through what will no doubt be a traumatic and, and, and testing time as their political system evolves but the chance of them coming out the other side of it still growing, I think, are sufficiently high for us to, 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 to use that as the working assumption on which we think about our future. And that means a China which is very powerful indeed. Of course, if India makes it happen, and I think India easily could, India will overtake China sometime early in the second half of the century. That's actually, that doesn't make it easier to manage, that makes it harder to manage. But we're a great power in a hurry might be a good slogan. And uh, just here, please. Uh, Dimitrios Strikos, uh, PhD candidate, London School of Economics. Thank you, Professor, for your insightful presentation. Uh, do you think that the growing utilization of Chinese space assets could be a source of stability or instability in terms of power production, maritime power production in sea denial? Sorry, just say the first bit again. That the growing utilization of Chinese space assets yes. could be a source. Yes. Just before you answer that, could you just pass the microphone back to the gentleman in the red tie? And we we'll just have two it's a, questions. It's a, it's, a very important, it's a very important question. And, and one, you know, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what I think. I was, I've been musing about this a bit recently. Because on the one hand, obviously, um, space, space assets are very important to China. I mentioned too, too briefly, perhaps for it to make much sense, how important in the sea denial, in the, in, in the, in the ascendancy of sea denial over sea control, one of the really critical things is the capacity to find ships as well as to sink them. And obviously satellite-based systems, not alone, because there's long, you know, long range, long endurance UAVs and so on, but satellite-based systems are very important for that. And it does seem to me that China's capacity to continue to develop its satellite-based maritime surveillance systems is going to be a, an important part of its capacity to achieve the kind of sea denial posture that I'm talking about. And therefore, those platforms are going to be very attractive targets for American air-sea air battle operations. On the other hand, the as the Chinese went to, I think, a little bit of trouble to demonstrate to us a few years ago, uh, two can play at that game. So whether or not the US and China end up fighting the kind of war in space as they start eroding one another's assets, and who ends up better off as a result of that, who's more dependent on space, those sorts of questions, um, I think is a very interesting and unknown question to, 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 to me unknown. But I would, my expectation is that China would both be prepared to fight a, 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 a sort of a, a war of mutual attrition against space-based assets with the United States on the basis the United States depends more on space than China does, and I would think China's capacity to, 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 to take out a lot of American space-based assets would be pretty high. 
And also, I think because the, this goes back to the point about proximity, because the, the waters we're talking about contesting are close to China. China's capacity to sustain uh, a, a pretty dense surveillance network of that, both with terrestrial systems like, you know, over the horizon, um, backscatter radars, uh, land-based uh, long endurance UAVs, and even, you know, air breathing manned um, surveillance aircraft and ships and so on. I think the Chinese, if, if, if the both sides are deprived of space-based surveillance assets, I think China's capacity to preserve a high enough level of surveillance over the contested waters is better than America's. So I think that might end up being to China's advantage, which means that they might both step back and, you know, it, it might be one of those situations where the war in space doesn't happen. And then yours will have to be the last question, I'm afraid, since we've exhausted our time. Thank you, sir. My name is Julien Saint-Quentin. I'm an officer from the French Navy. <clears throat> I'd like to come back to your initial argument about a sea control versus yeah. sea denial. Yeah. Um, I, I had a debate with a retired <laughs> uh, French uh, vice admiral uh, about this issue a couple of day, a couple of weeks ago. You might not be surprised to hear. Right. It. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, I, you described it as a permanent presence at sea and uh, a bit like an army would occupy a piece of land. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm glad you quoted Corbe after that, mm -hmm. because if you start considering sea control as actually occupying moving sea lines of communication, mm -hmm. especially when you master the uh, ability to determine your own position in high seas, which only the US can at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, I think it's still very much debatable whether it takes more forces to uh, control a bit of sea than to deny the sea control. And indeed, uh, I think in history, going back to the 17th century and, and the British fleet and its sea basing concept, mm. uh, we, we can argue the opposite, that it takes actually much uh, uh, fewer forces mm. to exercise sea control sure. yeah. and yeah. Uh, th thereafter yeah. it's, it's therefore uh, a good value for money to deploy yeah. a few carrier battle groups to have much larger forces stuck in their harbours. Yes, yes. Look, I, th I think um, uh, it's, a it's a very good point and deserves a, a longer answer than I'm going to have time to give it. But this seems to me to be the significance of the technological revolution that occurred at the end of the 19th century. Till the end of the 19th century, if you wanted to sink a ship, you needed to do it with a big gun. And a big gun needed to be carried on another big ship. So there was an essential symmetry between the forces you required for sea control and sea denial. And in fact, the distinction between sea control and sea denial in an era of naval warfare dominated by big guns and big batteries and big ships was therefore, I think, much weaker than it has been since then. What happened in the late 19th century, of course, was that both the nature of the ships changed, that is, they became easier to sink, um, and also the nature of the weapons changed, that is, you could start finding all sorts of ways to sink ships that didn't involve a big gun, like mines and torpedoes and bombs from aeroplanes and so on. And once that happened, it seems you've got a profound asymmetry in uh, sea denial and sea control, which seems to me to have been reflected pretty thoroughly in the history of naval warfare since then, that is, uh, in the 20th century. If you look at what happened, for example, in the North Sea uh, during the First World War, essentially neither side could achieve sea control. Both of them ended up achieving sea denial. The North Sea in the First World War was nobody's ocean. And when they tried to fight uh, a, a proper old-fashioned um, you know, fleet action to determine who was going to have sea control, they both frightened one another back to port with, with one another's submarines. So I think, I, I, and if you look at the role of mining, for example, in the First World War, I think you have the same implication. Likewise, Germany came remarkably close to achieving sea denial, even of the broader North Atlantic, to the British without using, without using surface ships, just with, just, just with submarines. So, I, and you know, you could tell the same story through um, uh, the, the, the history of the Second World War. The Pacific War, I think, is a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. Um, but it does seem to me that um, as, as long as you can sink um, uh, a, a $20 billion ship with a $2 billion submarine, um, and as long as you can find the ship, which is very critical. And it does seem to me to be profoundly, you know, that, that's the foundation of a profoundly asymmetrical relationship. And as a matter of fact, I think, you know, this is completely unscientific, it's bogus quantification, but I think it, it all feels to me like a ratio of 10 to 1. You have to put in 10 times as much effort to achieve sea control as to, to achieve sea denial. Um, now, uh, 
when, that, that is, of course, very dependent on, um, on that technological balance remaining as it is. But I, I, but I don't think it's just dependent, for example, on submarines. Some people argue, well, you do see Nile from submarines, therefore if submarines suddenly become more detectable, then that balance changes. But I don't think that's right. For example, I know I'm not at all sure whether the Chinese anti-ship ballistic missiles work or not. I, I certainly don't assume they don't. But, uh, but, but I, it, it doesn't seem to me to be at all, uh, uh, at all impossible that somebody will get them to work. And, uh, you know, sinking a $10 billion ship, even a $10 billion ship, which is not a very big ship these days, um, uh, with a $150 million ballistic missile, boy, that's good arithmetic. So I, 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 do, th I do think as, as, soon as, as, soon as, you, as, as soon as you could sink, a, sink uh, an adversary ship without sailing a, a comparable size ship alongside it, um, that what, 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 what had been true, I think you're right, that the, the balance is in fact in favour of sea control. Swap to sea denial, and I don't think it's ever gone back. Well, Hugh, um, that was very uh, invigorating, just a sort of thing to round off a week and carry us into the weekend <laughs> for some more reading. Uh, there are many ways in which I could thank you, but maybe a most useful one would be to point out to everybody here that your latest book, uh, The China you. Choice, Why America Should Chair Power, is available in fine bookshops everywhere, and I encourage you to, uh, to read it. <laughs> Hugh, thanks very much for doing this, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.